So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Sustainable Investment Professional Certification webinar series. Um, this is a co-presentation webinar series presented by the SIPC, the Climate Bonds Initiative, and the Network for Sustainable Financial Markets, NSFM as well. Now, this is the, co the first uh, co-presented webinar that uh, we've done. We're really excited to have this collaboration in place for the webinar today, and we're going to be doing many more of these co-presentations uh, in 2013 as well. So we look forward to bringing you some really fantastic speakers, um, along with our, our uh, distinguished speaker today, Sean Kidney, who is the CEO of the Climate Bonds Initiative, who will be talking about financing climate change solutions from debt capital markets. So for the agenda today, I'm gonna to provide you with a brief overview of the Sustainable Investment Professional Certification. I'll introduce Sean, and Sean will then present his presentation on financing climate change solutions. And then we're going to leave about 10 minutes at the end of the webinar for a Q&A session. So this is really your opportunity to uh, ask questions to Sean, any questions that you may have, and also to ask any questions that you may have on the Sustainable Investment Professional Certification. I'll also give you some instructions on how to ask questions uh, using the webinar platform a little bit later on as well. So the SIPC is an online certification geared towards financial investment and corporate professionals. It was started over a year ago and it was created to meet the demand for training and a designation in the rapidly growing area of sustainable investment. The SIPC is online, it's self-paced, and it's self-study. There's six modules in the program, and I'll give you a brief overview of the modules. They include uh, a, a module one, which is ethics. We then go on to governance. We then cover corporate social responsibility. We look at social sustainability, environmental sustainability, and sustainable investing as well. So each module in the program has an assignment associated with it, which is based on the teachings from each modules. So the SIPC is really designed to provide students with a unique set of skills, knowledge, and analytical thinking to take full advantage of new professional opportunities created by the potential of sustainable investing. Now, we have a lot of people and students taking the program that really take it to create a niche in this market and to be able to take a leading role moving forward in this rapidly developing area. They feel that getting the skills and knowledge provides them to take full advantage of these new opportunities, and they really want to become recognized with an official certification and the company credentials that come along with that. We now have a growing network of fellows of students and alumni who have taken the program. And as a sustainable investment professional, certified professional, you become part of this network and you get invited to events in this area as well. Now you can see on the screen that we have a number of supporting partners who help develop and start the program. And these are some really esteemed corporations based out of Canada. And recently we were also provided with approved provider program status from the CFA Institute as well. So that means if you're a CFA charter holder member, by taking the program, you receive continuing education credits as well. And we have a number, number of corporate educational partners as well. So these are corporations that saw the value in the skills and training that the SIPC provided. And they provided training to their employees uh, to take the program as well. So you can see the Business Development Bank of Canada is a recent corporate uh, educational partner who is paying for 15 of their employees to take the program currently. So if you uh, are part of an organization or are interested in becoming an educational partner and would like to provide uh, training in this area to your employees, please uh, feel free to contact us at any point to discuss how we can make that happen. So for any more information on the SIPC, you can see our website below. I really encourage you to take a visit to it. There's tons of information on the program, the modules, who it's geared for, um, and the different terms available. The uh, winter term starts January 1st, and applications uh, are now open for it. If you're interested in the program for the winter term, you can actually apply until March 1st. So if, uh, if this is something that interests you, I really encourage you to go to the website. Uh, and to apply uh, as soon as possible as uh, spots are filling up for the program as well. 
So I'm now going to pass on uh, control to Sean Kidney, who's the CEO of the Climate Bonds Initiative. Uh, and he's going to be able to uh, take control of the webinar, go through his presentation. But I just want to give a brief uh, introduction to Sean as well, and also an introduction for the Climate Bonds Initiative. Now, the Climate Bonds Initiative is an investor-focused NGO working to mobilize debt capital markets to fund a rapid global transition to a low-carbon economy. Sean Kidney is a member of the UK government's Capital Markets Climate Initiative. He's a member of Mercer Sustainable Opportunities Fund Advisory Panel and a director of the Network for Sustainable Financial Markets as well. He was previously marketing advisor to a number of the largest Australian pension funds and a social marketer and published, publisher. So really excited to have Sean with us from the UK today. Okay, just tell me when to change slides. Just click and we'll talk through. Okay. Three things we're going to cover today, size of client bonds market, opportunities, and how the client bond standards work. Thanks everyone for joining us. Before we launch into mechanics, I just want to cover why. There is an urgency underlying the work of the client bond standard and many other people working in this area. And that's summarized by the World Energy Outlook's statement recently that we are barreling towards a six to seven degree warming and catastrophic climate change on the planet. Just leave as is for a minute, David. The back one, the IEA says that our current projections, business as usual as they call it, we are clearly making no progress whatsoever on addressing climate change globally. Last year was in fact the highest rate of emissions increase on record globally. And if we don't make the transition to a low carbon world, we will see catastrophic economic as well as social environmental consequences by mid-century. The IEA also says we can fix it with about a trillion dollars a year investment in clean energy above business as usual. Investment that will pay dividends because it, subs it allows us to avoid fossil fuel inputs. They say a 36 trillion investment will A, be profitable and B, lead to 100 trillion in avoided fossil fuel costs. There are, however, adaptation costs involved in as well now because we have left it so late. We have two degrees centigrade warming in the system. We have a six foot sea level rise already in the system. The only question is, is whether it's going to take 30, 40 or 50 years to come through. And so we need to plan for those kinds of investments. The critical issue you need to know about, which is the mantra for us, is that to have a chance of meeting climate change scientists' views about emissions reductions we need to achieve and avoiding catastrophic, we need low carbon industries to be growing very fast. Wind, renewable, energy efficiency, sustainable agriculture for that matter. We need them all growing at maximum rates, which means 25 to 30 percent per annum. So our key KPI is that low carbon industries globally are averaging growth rates of 25 to 30 percent per annum. You're very lucky if you're working in those areas because we're working for you. But we can't promise a smooth ride. Rapid change can be volatile. So it isn't a particularly safe and secure area for investors. We're going to come back to that later. Next slide. Okay, Sean, try and see if you can take control one more time. Sure. There's a bit of a delay. Keep going. Okay, I can see your your cursor. Maybe just go to the bottom uh, left and change the slide that way. Otherwise, I can change it. There you go. Just takes a minute to cut in, but uh, we'll start working. First fact for you on the line is that uh, bond markets are remarkably untapped when it comes to climate change solutions and renewable energy. According to Bloomberg New Energy Finance, there was about 260 billion investment in clean energy last year. According to the Climate Policy Institute, there are about 386 billion in the broad range of climate change solutions. We know from the IEA, as I mentioned, we have to be spending at least a trillion a year just on the clean energy and other energy related transformations. And we've got about another trillion a year in a few years from adaptation. Of course, there's one exciting thing, 
which is that bond markets are currently worth 100 trillion versus equities of 55 trillion. That is that bond markets are nearly twice the size of equities. That's a flip in the last 10 years. This is a consequence of the financial crash and a flight to safety and security into bonds. We're really entering the age of bonds when it comes to financial instruments. Bonds are curiously ideal for renewables. Renewables typically have big capital expenditure and pretty low, very low running cost. They just, solar just sits in the desert and earns money. For a bond, which is all raising the money up front and then earning interest year in, year out, it's a very nice match, long-term bonds. Nuclear power, for example, has got a big risk element at the end to pull down the plant to clean up the site. Natural gas has much more volatility in pricing as you go along. You can't be sure where natural gas prices will be in 10 years, so doing a 20-year costing for the plant is just that much more complex and risky. So in theory, there should be a good match. Who buys these bonds? The group that's most important for us is institutional investors. Institutional investors make up $80 trillion of assets under management globally. They control 73% of the New York Stock Exchange. They are by far, in Western countries, the dominant owners of capital. This is a change in the last 20 to 30 years. Institutional investors, keep going, David, are made up, keep going, of pension funds, roughly 30 trillion, and it's important to note that they're dominated by public sector pension funds. The largest in the world is Japanese. Insurance sector, worth roughly 27 trillion, keep going. Sovereign wealth and foundations, they're the four pillars of the institutional investor section. Local pension funds are part of this. We have a class of investors that is committed to long-term, stable, sustainable returns, at least in principle, maybe not always in practice. There are some odd stories around. And majority of their investments, to varying degrees, are in bonds. Allianz, for example, one of the largest insurance company in the world, has 90% of its assets under management in bonds. One of the characteristics for our perspective of this particular sector is that they are surprisingly aware of climate change issues. Investors worth 22.5 trillion assets under management last year signed strong, powerful statements calling on governments to address climate change. This, by the way, included all the top US pension funds. So it's not just the European concern. They specifically asked for carbon prices, for initiatives to grow renewables, and for initiatives to work in adaptation. However, it's very difficult to ask one particular fund to take on a risk, or even a group of funds, when it's a socialised problem. Getting them to take on greater risk with renewables or of large products, all of which are novel, new, lack of track history, is difficult. However, when they asked if you were given two investments, of the same interest rate and risk rating, one green, one brown, they invariably say they would choose green because of their recognition of the macro risks they're concerned about. That's the sweet spot when it comes to climate bonds. We need to be looking at how we can work with governments and the community to engineer investment products that match the yield and returns requirements of our pension funds so that we can save the planet plus ensure we have a pension in 20, 30, 40 years time. What do investors want? Well, they want scale. Above all, the big institutional investors that control the bulk of the money don't buy one or two million dollar projects or bonds as a rule. A lot of the investments in climate change so far are quite small scale wind farms, solar farms, energy efficiency investments. The kinds of bonds you're going to see in this area are project bonds. There are a range from the biggest being mid-American solar in the US last year, 860 million, to small 5 million project bonds. However, the bulk of lending to projects remains banks and will remain banks. So we don't believe that raising a bond to then go off and build something 
is necessarily going to be the main way bonds are used. Partly that is because the, all the risk of these projects is piled up in the first couple of years of development. It's policy risk, planning risk, community risk, etc. Once it's built, it becomes a very safe as houses type of investment. So that's where we think institutional investors need to come in to pick up the assets and take them off equity investors and banks once they're built. The second large area of bonds are bank or corporate bonds. Now, this is a big slice of the global market. We're promoting what are called asset link bonds in this area, modeled on the European Investment Bank or the World Bank climate bonds, where you rate their earmark bonds. The same could apply to US Treasury raising victory clean energy bonds. And there's a bill before Congress about this at the moment, which are essentially backed by the US government, but the money is dedicated to a specific activity, renewable energy in that case. So, equally, a company like uh, General Electric could raise bonds linked to their wind energy manufacturing assets. An investor who likes the GE credit rating but also likes to have an overlay of green will be very attracted to that particular bond. GE is going to get some new investors. The first certified climate bonds, and I will come back to certifications later, are going to be bonds in this particular area. A bank is issuing a $300 million bond which is linked to a portfolio of wind energy loans that they've made. The client bond standard allows that promise and that the linkage to be verified by a third party. The wind farms really exist, the loans really exist, the money is going to the right place. The third area of bonds where we think the biggest requirement is going to be in the future is aggregation, portfolio bonds, asset-backed securities. This is partly because as we're learning to better manage banks post-financial crash, we are requiring much higher capitalization levels. That means their ability to do business lending is actually reduced compared to what it's in the past. They have previously used securitization to get over that problem, not always for good purposes, but the securitization idea worked very well as a principle, specifically to lower the cost of interest rates in housing in the 60s and 70s and 80s in places like the US and the UK. This is going to be essential. The IMF says it, the OECD says it. It's going to be essential to kickstart economies and for green lending. We need to be able to use securitization as a means of passing on assets from banks who are doing the high risk two to five year lending to pension funds and insurance funds who want the low risk post construction 20 to 30 year lending. We will see half a billion to a billion dollar style bonds around wind, solar and energy efficiency assets. A little subset for those of the Cognoscenti will be covered bonds, which are dual recourse bonds. They're a kind of cross between the blue and orange circle, where you get a bond guaranteed by a bank treasury, but if the bank goes under, you own the loan portfolio. So it's a much better credit rating as a result than a bank's own bonds. They also want investment grade, and this is actually the hard part, but the most important part of the work going forward. The risks we have are social risks, community risks. The biggest risk is actually policy risk. You ask any investor what they worried about renewable energy, and they will say that governments change their minds. Finding means to give them guarantees to avoid their exposure to policy risk they don't understand and don't control is very important to getting comfort for investors in going into renewable energy and other climate change solutions. So that kind of partnership between public sector and institutional investors is the most important area of play in coming years. It includes credit enhancement, which multinational development banks currently do for developing projects. They need to do more of it for green projects. They also need scale. We have a lot of small projects in the renewable energy and energy efficiency space. We need to make them big so that investors can actually consume them. We see that equity and bank loans are going to focus on the two to five year process. We then need to aggregate all those little bank loans that banks have made and possibly wind farms and solar farms, individual solar farms, put them into aggregation vehicles that can issue bonds that, that buy banks and utilities that pension funds and insurance companies will buy. That's the big financial system policy task. 
where are we up to? Well, early this year we put out a report with HSBC on bonds and climate change, the state of the market. A few higher points, then I'm going to ask Bridget Boole to do that research to just run you through a couple of slides. But I can say that investor interest and in links between bonds and climate change is definitely growing. The conversations we have, the specific increase in bond sales that we're beginning to see in key markets like France and the UK and the US, and the stated interest on the part of institutional investors is there. Converting it to reality is the next. We happen to have found that there are already $174 billion of bonds, which we would say are linked to climate change. They're essentially pure play. That's where it might be an asset-backed bond or a bond issued by a company that only works in climate change solutions. Within that, there are $12 billion of bonds which are labelled climate or green bonds, mainly issued by banks like the World Bank or the European Investment Bank. Europe is the largest use issuer so far, but the USA has been the most innovative. Further market growth needs to be developed for standardisation, aggregation and policy support. Bridget Boole is the researcher who worked on that project. I'm just bringing her in now. Good afternoon all. I'm just running you through um, a quick bit of the detail about the report that we wrote. Um, the $174 billion that Sean has just mentioned um, is broken down into seven themes. The first is fairly obvious, um, energy. And that includes things like renewable energy, obviously, but we also decided to include nuclear for its low carbon attributes. Um, it includes small hydro, but not large hydro. Um, uh, we reference various research and uh, we have reasons for this. Um, the next is our sort of efficiency theme, which is uh, buildings and industry efficiency. And in, through this theme, we focused on companies providing technology um, and those working on projects to improve energy efficiency in buildings and in industrial processes. Um, and that was mostly corporates that came under that. The next theme was transport. Um, in this, we included rail um, and also public transport um, like bus systems. We referenced OECD research, which um, saw uh, bus, bus transportation as um, much more carbon efficient than um, individual road transport through cars. Um, and rail, we, we like to include, um, as we see the economy really, the uh, low carbon economy um, in order to get there, we really have to go from all angles at once. So although um, rail, which is, um, say, electric rail, might not be, um, you, the electricity might not be renewable at this stage, we still say that we have to build the rail at the moment and the renewable energy will, will catch up. Um, if we wait until the renewable energy is big enough before building the rail, it, it, it's too late. Um, the next was finance, so this includes the World Bank programs that Sean spoke of. Um, we also <coughs> included water, so sustainable water programs, water management, flood control, um, waste and pollution control, recycling, um, reducing tailpipe emissions, and um, uh, waste management practices. And uh, lastly, agriculture and forestry, where we tried to pick up on um, sustainable land use um, techniques and uh, sustainable forest management. Um, as you'll see in the next slide, um, the overwhelmingly largest theme was transport, which is, when you think about it, not a huge surprise, um, given the inclusion of rail. Um, rail has been financed by bonds for decades, um, and so that is very well used finance instrument um, for, for rail. Um, but the other themes um, were also quite big, so energy and finance, obviously two big ones. And then the much smaller ones, like agriculture, um, waste and buildings, reflect um, less use of bonds in their history to finance growth, um, but also um, just differences in, in the size of the companies that issue bonds um, and, uh, and in the ability for us to pick them up. Um, so a lot of them are small private companies. So that was the um, main thematic breakdown. Then um, going to a little bit of the analysis, um, I'll leave it you to um, read this later for the purposes of time, um, but you can see 
really what each of the themes um, were uh, included mostly. So you can see transport was mostly rail and what the split of energy was. One quick um, you, thing you might notice, there was no water in the previous slide. Um, we had a, quite, a, quite a lot of discussions about the water theme and we've decided to do a separate piece of work on it um, as the, the time we had for the original report wasn't enough for us to be able to include any water bonds. Um, we would like to, we'd like to include them um, in the future, but we really wanted to make sure that the bonds we included were truly sustainable water bonds. And a lot of the companies providing technology relating to sustainable water <coughs> are not pure play. So <coughs> and a lot of utilities, we found it difficult to separate one from another. Um, so some utilities might be quite energy and water efficient um, and employ best available technology and others don't. And we found it very difficult um, to separate these. Um, and we didn't think that just being a water utility was enough. So, so that's uh, an interesting part about water. Um, next slide gives us the geographic split. So in the first, uh, it's a bit slow, but in the, you, the largest uh, bubble is for the um, UK and uh, next is France. So it's showing Europe um, with a huge rail network. So um, much of that is rail. Um, and then the US. And in, in the US, we had much broader um, split of themes and of issuers. So in the US there was a large number of project bonds which Sean referenced earlier like the solar topaz bond um, as well as a large number of municipal bonds um, for, water, for um, pollution control and for energy efficiency um, and those are government programs. And then um, got Germany next also in Europe, um, Russia and Canada also both mostly rail um, and then China, which fucked the trend in many ways um, compared to Europe, where um, China had very little rail at all and um, was mostly a renewable energy and pure play companies and um, uh, others around that theme. So actually very little rail. And the rest of the world makes up um, 25 billion, so quite small in comparison to those countries I've just mentioned. Um, here is a bit of detail on the geographic uh, splits and gives you a bit of flavour on um, areas where we see growth. So um, South Korea and Brazil um, in particular. I'm not going to go through these now, but I'll leave them to, for you to read it your, in your own time. In fact, Sean. So the way forward. When it comes to the existing bond market, first thing is that our report through our report, we found that it's broader and deeper than anyone thought, but we still need to accelerate it because it's way short of what's required. We clearly need to see some aggressive steps to aggregate for scale. Um, there are only 103 bonds at the moment over the half a billion dollar threshold, and that really is an important threshold. So we need to see many, many more at that threshold. We know that we need to give further support to get investment grade ratings. We're now beginning to see some solar and wind bonds coming in at triple B minus, which is the absolute minimum investment grade you can get away with, but not all of them. Um, that does mean at least rate, the rating agencies are improving their understanding of renewable energy investments. Uh, structuring makes a big difference and the bodies standing behind some of these bonds. But uh, to be able to accelerate this market, we're going to have to dive in with further forms of public finance to enhance credit. A good example in Europe is the European Union's Project Bond 2020 initiative which has been piloted in 2013. It's modest, the eligibility criteria are still needing a lot of work, but the idea to support in that case grid inter interconnections that will support uh, renewable balancing across countries, uh, to support um, North Sea grid and as time goes on they are saying we'll support renewable energy development is very important. I think those sort of initiatives should be rolled out around the world. Um, the last point is that we need to look at um, standardization. And David, I seem to have lost control of this. Okay, thank you. One of the things about bond markets 
is they're a commodity business. They don't really work with bespoke deals here and there. They work really well when there are millions of loans made with very similar features and characteristics. Standardization of loan agreements, standardization of credit assessments, these things are very important to going forward. If we are to grow this market, then the industry, which means regulators and banks and investors, need to work together on developing better models and approaches to standardization across these sectors. This doesn't just apply to renewables, this applies to any financial sector that's making the shift from early stage to mature stage. It's just that we need it to happen fast on renewables if we're to see bonds flowing in the sector. Towards that end, there is a project that we're working on with a bunch of other organisations, which is certification for climate bonds to make it easier for investors to locate climate relevant or climate kosher investments, to assure them that their investments will be for climate change solutions. That is that simple, is this green or not really, when it's the same yield, the same risk rating as a brown bond. To make it very easy, we're looking at a listing on Bloomberg as part of it. Uh, we're looking at promoting those bonds when they come out so investors are aware of them. But we are absolutely telling the industry we need equivalent risk reward not to expect to get differential rates, especially at this early stage of market development. We are hoping that the standard can help with the standardization of definitions across a large pool. If we can lump for an investor energy, transport, water relevant to climate change in a filter across the whole portfolio, that increases the potential for liquidity. There's just not enough solar bonds, not enough energy efficiency bonds to be a large enough universe at this stage. Then finally, but most importantly, the easier it is to find this stuff, the more the people buy it. There is very significant latent interest, but it's got to be very easy. The barrier to doing it has got to be very, very small. We are looking at an environmental, not a financial or credit standard. This is not competition with Standards and Poor's or Moody's, but rather complementary. And for that reason, Standards and Poor's is on our advisory, uh, so I'm sorry, our working group. Behind this is a coalition of organisations that are backing it. Calsters, the second largest US pension fund, is on our Climate Bond Standards Board, as is the Australian Investor Group on Climate Change, representing $700 billion of investors in Australia. The US Investor Network on Climate Risk, representing $11 trillion of investors. The Treasurer, State Treasurer of California, is on our Standards Board. Natural Resources Defence Council and finally the Carbon Disclosure Project. And we'll see a couple more organisations join that board this year. We have an industry working group made up of a number of other organisations, some of which you will recognise, Aviva Investors in particular, 260 billion sterling under management. Uh, we also have a series of technical working groups that take on the hard job of looking at eligibility criteria in different parts of our model. We have a low carbon transition model. As Bridget said, we believe rail, even though it may not be in the case of high speed, particularly carbon efficient now, has to be built now to be ready when the grid is green. In the energy efficiency area at the moment, for example, we have a working group that involves representatives of the International Energy Agency, the European Bank of Reconstruction Development, the US Green Building Council, and so on. The coalition of the willing Uh, is essentially going to be assuring investors that the process of getting to certification is solid, that the underlying engineering of what will end up being a very simple, invisible standard is trustworthy. Why would issuers do it? Well, this is a chance to get access to new investors who are concerned about climate. It is, of course, in the early stages going to be a matter of reputation enhancement to fly the flag of what they're doing in the climate change solutions. For those of us that are conscious about long-term financial macroeconomic issues, it's about educating the market about underlying assets so that when Basel III starts further reducing banks' ability to uh, lend to business and to renewables, we will have the beginnings of an asset-backed securities market because investors will have become more conscious and understanding of the assets. Of course, 
the goal is lower rates and at least a $300 billion a year cloud bonds market. That's what we're looking for. The opportunity facing us going forward, I think I mentioned earlier, just to restate, is essentially a pact between government and long-term investors. Governments, their job is to adjust the system settings, to stretch the public balance sheet, to support secure returns for investors, relatively secure. Institutional investors then provide the finance at low rates. That's the pact. We're talking about not banks, we're not, not hedge funds, not private equity, but institutional investors who are the people who in the end have the capital to deploy. Out of that, we get clean energy for all, we get green growth stimulus, which will certainly allow the depressed economies in Japan, the European Union and the US to grow in a way they're not going to be able to otherwise grow. And mostly importantly for those of us who are acutely aware of the climate change science, like Fatih Birol, the chief scientist of the International Energy Agency, it's about averting catastrophe and rapid adaptation. That's our website. When you get this PowerPoint, uh, there will be a couple of further information slides and an appendix as well. Otherwise, feel free to send us questions and ask them now. David, I'm turning the control of this back over to you. If That's I great. Make... <clears throat> Thank you so much, Sean and Bridget, for uh, a really informative presentation on this rapidly developing area. Um, it was really insightful. We're going to now open up the webinar to uh, some questions and answers. I think we have about uh, maybe about 10 minutes. Um, now there's two options to ask questions. You should see a hand icon on your control panel. If you click that, that will allow you to ask a question out loud, which everyone will hear. Alternatively, you can type your question in the question box on your control panel. I will then ask that question out loud and Sean uh, and or Bridget will be able to answer it. So I see there's some questions already. I'm going to attempt to um, pull some of them up now. Uh, Sean, our first question is uh, from John Weiss. How has the USA been innovative in issuing bonds and what more can be done? Do you want to give me a couple of questions? Yeah. Can you hear me, Sean? Yes, I can. Okay, how has the USA been innovative in issuing bonds and what more can be done? Okay, give me a couple of further questions, David, and I'll answer them at once. Okay. Can you comment on emerging markets for new infrastructure versus developed markets for rebuild slash retrofits? Will there be enough volume to take this out of the bank's market into the capital markets? Those are the two questions I have right now, Sean. On the US, well, you know, the first thing is that the US is the world's most advanced bond market. So pretty well every other bond market has a lot to learn from the uni market, from the private placement market, and from the traded market. In terms of innovating, we've seen large-scale project bonds coming out of the US, which haven't been coming out of other countries. We've seen relatively sophisticated investor appetite, so uh, particularly amongst insurance funds, John Hancock being a leader, that have allowed this market to grow, and they're the sorts of lessons we need to learn. We've also seen regular use of tax credits and other kinds of financial incentives. I mean, after all, the US is the granddaddy of tax credits for the oil and gas industry. We've learned that way. Applying those lessons to renewable energy, and by the way, if there are any US policymakers on hand, switching all those brown, dirty fossil fuel tax credits over to clean green, and the OECD says there's a current ratio in OECD countries of somewhere between six and ten fossil fuel subsidies to one renewable energy subsidy, so this is a big issue, is vital. That sort of innovation is there from past industries. We can now apply it and are beginning in some areas to apply it to green. There's, of course, a whole carbon argument. I'm letting, leaving that alone because institution investors aren't particularly keen on carbon. It's too risky an area. If you can make carbon work in the mechanics of your projects, that's your business. Don't expect to have carbon appear in the coupon of a bond. That's not a very successful strategy. The second comment, emerging markets and new infrastructure. You know, it is extraordinary the amount of building work that has to happen in countries like India. <coughs> According to uh, a talk at, in Doha, I listened to, Siemens said, 90% of all buildings in India have to be built between now and 2025. That is 90% by 2025. It will be new. That's the scale required. 
of course, if we can make them green, and I will say that the Indian Bureau of Energy Efficiency is one of the best energy efficiency bureaus in the world and has had some amazing successes with regulations. If we can make those buildings green, being we can have a great contribution to dampening the growth of energy use and reducing the need to be building coal as well as renewable in this grand global energy transition we're going to be going through over the next 40 years. So that is so there are lots of opportunities. Of course, they're high return opportunities, largely, but they're all also high risk opportunities. Because they're high risk opportunities, pension funds don't like them. Someone has to step in and pick up the policy risk piece of those investments if we're to do a good match between US, European and Indian pension funds and the nature of those investments. And that's going to be governments and their own banks. So we still need to do a fair amount of work there. The scale of the new build and the retrofit build in some countries, like in China, dwarfs the retrofitting opportunity in the US and the European Union. But that doesn't mean those jobs aren't incredibly important to do, particularly given the scale of energy use in advanced countries. So, you know, all of these things have to work. Different policy instruments will be relevant in different jurisdictions. There will be bonds flowing from every jurisdiction. You know, if we can get this right, this is a long economic boom. This is an amazing capital-based stimulus for the global economy, and hopefully one that works on multiple fronts to improve things. Please, David, further questions? Sean, in terms of aggregation, A, who are the natural sponsors? NGOs may not have enough capacity to create true markets. How to get global banks going, governments, and B, how to get rating agencies evolved, involved enough to legitimately rate instruments as investment grades? Thank you. Uh, I have a lot of sympathy for the rating agencies. This stuff that we're building doesn't have a lot of history. It's hard to figure out how to rate it. A lot of it is entirely dependent on capricious governments who have a habit of being voted out and being replaced by some other idiots who don't understand climate change. This is a high risk environment. So I do have a lot of sympathy for rating agencies. I do think they nevertheless overpriced the risk on solar and wind in many markets. So there is work to be done. And one thing I do absolutely know is that they absolutely underweight the risk on fossil fuel companies. So the balance of investments is wrong. You know, uh, X Strata, BP, ExxonMobil, all have reserves valued on their balance sheets at full value, and they shouldn't be at full value because of the IEA's right, two thirds of those reserves have to stay in the ground for us to make this transition. At least there's got to be a risk premium on those things. One. Two is aggregation sponsors. It won't be NGOs. It can't be NGOs. The opportunities are banks. If someone like Deutsche Bank were to propose an aggregation facility and then go to the Inter-American Development Bank and say, can you give us some credit hats from Latin American loans? You know, the Inter-American Development Bank is going to say probably yes, subject to the deal. We need to be getting the traditional lenders in this business to be a little bit more creative about putting together these instruments. That's one. Two is there is scope for cooperative ventures between countries and development banks and businesses to develop these vehicles where banks are merely service providers doing the hard jacker for a simple fee. That's where I think the biggest growth will happen in the next couple of years as we seek to establish a green securitization market. There will be small other opportunities with financial expertise, organizations of financial expertise that could get involved in this to make it happen. <coughs> but it can't be NGOs and it won't be governments by themselves in our view. Finally, how do we get global banks going? Well, actually, we have a lot of global banks already. The issue is more restructuring the global banking environment. The existing banks need to be regulated towards doing project lending, which they should be good at doing. Pension funds and insurance funds become the long-term credit banks, in the words of Torben Morgan Peterson, the CEO of Pensions Denmark. They will be picking up the assets once they've gone through the risk project building phase and then holding on to them for 30 years or 40 years to pay their pension liabilities or insurance liabilities. So we're just seeing a different structure to the banking market going forward, and that will be a global agenda. 
Dave. Thanks, Sean. Um, we're going a little bit past time. Sean, are you okay for another five, uh, five, seven, eight minutes? If you and our friends around the world online are happy to, I'm happy to. Okay, sounds great. Um, we have a couple questions just about the presentation, if it's going to be available. Uh, it's been recorded. It will be up on the SIPC website. Unfortunately, because of the holidays, it won't be available till the new year. Um, <clears throat> Sean, if people wanted a copy of the PowerPoint, are they able to cl contact Climate Bonds in order to get that? or? Yes, they are. Uh, I'm afraid I, I neglected to put my email address on the PowerPoint, but it's just Sean at S-E-A-N at climatebonds.net. Okay. Feel free to email and we will email it back to you. That's great. Um, so question, Sean. Asset-backed securities have had some very poor results in the past. How will these bonds avoid the excesses and poor regulation of the past issues? I'm sorry, David. Just give me the first line of the question. Asset-backed securities have had some very poor results in the past. How will these bonds avoid the excesses and poor regulation of the past issues? Look, it's important to note that the bulk of asset-backed securities have not had a bad result over the lifetime of the industry. For the 70s and 80s and 90s, asset-backed securities in the mortgage market did a great job of reducing the cost of finance. I myself have a home loan which was done through securitization, was securitized. That allowed me to get a, a loan that was a full percentage point cheaper than a bank loan. That made a big difference to me, especially when interest rates were higher. So uh, the same tools have been applied to student loans, to SME loans. This is a well-tested well instrument. What happened really was that in the 90s and the 2000s, we lost control of a few things. The, some foolish decisions were made in the US about privatizing Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac without appropriate safeguards. Some particularly foolish decisions were made not to regulate derivatives. Um, we had a swaps market that can only be said to have gone utterly haywire globally in the absence of proper prudential supervision. A series of things happened. You could argue there was increased liquidity produced by the China. He's buying US bonds at a time the US was spending prolifically on a Iraqi evasion. There are all these issues that went wrong in the last 15 years. That doesn't mean that the core instrument that worked so well for 30 years wasn't a good instrument. Now the lesson for this year, the next 12 months, is to properly understand what went wrong, and this is the agenda of the Network for Sustainable Financial Markets, for example, and what worked, and make sure that we have a regulatory environment, a properly supervised environment, that it can ensure that what is an utterly essential instrument now, as the IMF and the OECD are telling us, is used again in a responsible way. We need a responsible securitization market. That will be led by public sector institutions. I am more likely to buy an instrument if I know that the EIB or the IADB or a government has some active involvement in making it work, and that's what I'm going to be looking for as I rebuild confidence in the instrument as we grow it again. I will tell you also that we are deeply concerned about the nature of the regulatory environment to make sure that not only is it robust to ensure we don't get the madnesses of the last 10 years, but equally is not overly restrictive to kill uh, the golden goose or to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Sean, do you see any Sean, I have another question here. Do you see any room for the expansion of products for the private sector to not just work with multilateral development institutions, but also with bilaterals? If so, in what shape might you see this happening? Um, there's a lot of room for straightforward commercial deals at the moment in the absence of any kind of government involvement. In many markets, just to give you in the renewable space, Renewables are cost competitive, are cheaper than fossil fuels. Hawaii, Jamaica, uh, many African countries. When it comes to energy efficiency, it's pretty hard to find a market around the world where energy efficiency doesn't provide a, a rational business case. There are non-financial reasons blocking energy efficiency deals. So these don't necessarily need any kind of government credit enhancement invo involvement. They may need government to push decision making along in the energy efficiency space. However, in many other areas, what counts is the application of public sector guarantees to kickstart and to drive down the cost. It's not just guarantees too, by the way. I mean, I will tell you now that if we could get a few one gigawatt solar deals up in key countries, we would rapidly drive down, much more rapidly than we're doing now, drive down the already fast dropping price of solar. 
and that would probably do more than any guarantees over time to make sure that solar crowds out fossil fuel investments. And the same applies to wind, but is still on a significant learning curve. Having said that, the simple answer is bilateral, multilateral, we don't care, whatever works, and it will be different in different jurisdictions. There was a last bit of that question I haven't answered, David. I can't remember what it was. Well, there's a follow-up question to it um, from the same participant. Additionally, if we are to move towards commoditized products and ostensibly cross-border products, how can we build sub-national enhancements for green projects, such as the ITC here in the U.S. or the new Brazilian infrastructure bond incentives, into a larger bond offering? Well, the first thing is that the definitions about what are eligible investments need to be common. It's very hard for us to build a larger market if we don't get that in place. We're doing a bit of that work with the standards. We're trying to encourage the development banks who are drivers of these markets in some areas to work together to make sure that the standards are the same. That's, that's one aspect of it. Um, the second aspect is we need to link up all these facilities in terms of educating and explaining them to the market. Um, making sure there's a secondary market is very important. Kickstarting a secondary market is likely to involve public sector support uh, through a variety of mechanisms. I, I think that's what I would say. I would simply say otherwise, let a thousand flowers bloom. I mean, the sub-regional incentive uh, programs, in some cases, are very good, innovative. Um, they're everything from uh, PPA guarantees provided by state governments to um, uh, development banks in Brazil, BNDS, really dominates that whole economy, stepping in and supporting projects all around the place. There, it will be jurisdiction specific the way forward. I mean, in different in different places like uh, California, you are seeing active support for energy efficiency, residential and commercial projects, which isn't a quit enhancement, but actually leads to a safer bond offering on the back of those loan portfolios. So there's all sorts of things to get out of work. We don't, we don't believe there is a simple prescription for markets. Uh, I think we're going to take one more question, Sean. Um, you might have covered a little bit of this question in some of your answers already. You mentioned stability in government policy. Can you say which policies would be most useful to growing the climate bond market? Well, if, if you ask an investor, they always say, just give us certainty, please, please, please. But, you know, politics is more complicated than that. Um, fundamentally, in the renewable space, it's the nature of power purchase agreements and the support and guarantees for those, or in those markets where renewables are not currently directly competitive, the bulk of markets still, it's feed-in tariffs or other kinds of renewable energy incentives and the confidence investors have in those going forwards. I mean, in Australia, for example, that has a carbon tax now and a government that's being relatively activist, investors are deeply worried about an opposition party that keeps saying that they want to scrap the whole thing. Now, whether they will or not is an open question, but that obviously uh, unnerves investors. In the UK, we have a government who has been pressing a series of changes in renewable energy policy, but has recently appointed a couple of ministers to renewable energy positions who are known, known as climate change skeptics. That just rocks investor confidence. So there are all sorts of things that need to be addressed. I, I would say to investors, you need to appreciate that this is the biggest single medium to long term, and in some cases short term, the poor old Maldives, for example, threats to your economy and society, and you need to be setting in place mechanisms that will provide assurance in the same way as you would with tollways or railway lines, this is not rocket science, that will give investors in renewable and in other climate change solutions confidence about putting their money in. And I'll leave it at that. Well, that brings us to the end of the webinar. Sean, unfortunately, there was a lot of questions that we couldn't get to. Um, that's a, a testament to this uh, this area and this, this, this presentation that you gave. Um, maybe I can just say if people wanted to contact you with some of the questions, that that's okay. Uh, you provided your email before. Um, and also, there are some questions about the SIPC program. Please feel free to contact us uh, through our website with any questions that you may have. And I just want to take this opportunity to um, thank Sean and Bridget for a, a really informative and uh, eye-opening presentation. We really appreciated uh, your time this afternoon. And uh, thank you all for joining us. We had a huge turnout David, for this. David, before you before you sign off, David. Yeah. Can I just restate my email address, Sean, S-E-A-N, Sean at climatebonds.net. For those people who haven't had a question or who would like to 
and get the answers to further questions. Email and I will put all questions on a group email and respond to a group email so people can see the answers to other questions and we can carry this forward a bit further until all questions are exhausted. That's great, Sean. And we'll have this uh, presentation recorded and up on our website uh, early on in the new year as well. So thank you again. Thank you. Bye now.